In 2010, I was selected to go down to the South Pole Station in Antarctica for an entire year by Raytheon Polar Services as an employee of a third-party contractor for the National Science Foundation. The Ice Cube Neutrino Detector is presented as a passive listening device for the purposes of the science as presented. But I'm going to skip right through the chase, folks. Uh, I have provided documentation that proves that the 5,160, what they call DOMs, that are embedded in the ice can actually transmit at 2,047 volts each. That gives us a long list of things to consider. It is effectively a multifaceted directed energy weapons platform that I will uh, list rapidly a few things that it can do. Vehicle detection. We're learning that these off-world craft, on-world craft, ours or other nations are also emitting neutrinos. So this makes the South Pole Station effectively an air traffic control station for this new level of equipment that nobody's discussing. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. That was Eric Hecker from Stephen Greer's disclosure event, 12 June. So a few weeks ago, Eric Hecker says that the ice cube neutrino detection scientific experiment at the South Pole, so down in Antarctica, can actually detect, and he says, transmit. I thought this was an amazingly interesting briefing that he gave. I had honestly never heard of the ice cube neutrino detector and then have spun up very quickly. I was very curious how this would even work. Is this even possible to have this sort of neutrino detection device in the ice? I mean, it's just an amazing scientific experiment in itself anyway, but could it even be possible? Could it work? And what I've looked into it, I found some pretty, pretty interesting things. Also last night we had two breakthrough breakthrough scientific announcements. One was the gravitational waves. The gravitational wave background has been detected. This is in the Washington Post where democracy dies in darkness. I'm actually seeing democracy die right in the sunlight and open source right in front of our eyes. In a major discovery, scientists say space-time churns like a choppy sea. The mind-bending findings suggest that everything around us is constantly being roiled by low-frequency gravitational waves. What they did is they, they actually used pulsars. Pulsars are apparently stars, neutron stars that are spinning at, at a certain exact, exact speed that you can even rate it by a mechanical clock, essentially. Think of them as atomic clocks. Supposedly they are even more accurate than an atomic clock, which seems pretty interesting to me. How are we gonna have more accurate than atomic clock stars? Which again, goes back to the theory of, you know, larger systems mirroring or resembling in octaves of very small systems. Atomic clocks resembled neutron stars. So in this case, we had the pulsars. Pulsars, if you know that they're always spinning and you can, you make the assumption that they're always spinning at the exact same speed, now you can start to map out the water. Okay, if you imagine you're in an ocean out there, we're in a fluid, an ocean of fluid. The feat builds on previous discoveries of things in the universe that are invisible to the naked eye. Pulsars, a pulsar is a type of neutron star the ultra-dense remnant of a dead star. It's called a pulsar because it spins rapidly, hundreds of revolutions per second, and it also emits radio waves. So every time it spins, so you basically we're getting consistent radio waves, right? If you assume that those are exactly consistent, now you can determine what is actually moving, the actual space-time itself, the universe itself is actually moving, and we can detect these through gravity waves by looking out in the universe at the pulsars. Okay, that's essentially how, how it worked. What does this mean? There's a gravity wave background, similar to the cosmic microwave background. Now we have a gravity microwave background. Gravity wave background, again, we don't know where the source comes from. They're saying it's gonna be the Big Bang, but again, they don't know the source. I consider it as a temperature. Basically like every black body in the universe has a certain temperature. Every organic organism has a temperature. We have a certain black body temperature. My, my own guess speculation is that this is going to be a black body temperature for whatever thing we are inside of, whatever the universe actually is. That's the gravity microwave background. But just great to see that breakthroughs are coming through and looking outside and we are learning more about our environment. We're learning much, much more about our actual ecosystem that we live in, the actual earth lives in. Thinking outside instead of just squabbling, slapping each other here on the earth, fighting like little, you know, little kids killing each other. We can now look up and maybe learn more 
about the universe. So very excited to see that. So in the same day, later in the day was what I consider even a bigger, a bigger announcement is the ice cube neutrino. So that device that Eric Hecker, the, the contractor says is this nefarious device, or it's basically a multifaceted directed energy weapons platform that can be used for nefarious purposes. He says it is being used for nefarious purposes. So let's look into that and see how that would even be possible. The announcement, so you can go watch it, your own ice cube announcement, June 29, 2023. They go through all of their findings, basically that they are able to detect sources of neutrinos. But I wanted to just play a little clip here. This is really piqued my interest. I watched this whole thing and right at the end, I was like, that's a weird answer. And so check this, what they've kept secret now is the sources. So they've determined sources of neutrinos and we'll go through in a little bit, but I just wanna play this so you get a, a little idea of what, what I'm talking about here. Sources of neutrinos. So where are these neutrinos coming from? Thank you. So perhaps one final question uh, from online, please. Uh, this one might also make you uncomfortable, but uh, there's questions about uh, what looks like some of the clumpiness in the maps that you show. Uh, any comments about potential correspondence with sources uh, that we think we might know about? Um, let me read that to um, um, Naoko again, please. No comment, <laughs> but stay tuned. Okay, so this is the Ice Cube Observatory, right? The Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. First off, this thing is just awesome. Okay, so I know I've been very negative lately, and I and I give the military industrial complex a hard time. I think it should be killed and destroyed and removed from our world. That's probably not going to happen. But I'd also just like to say that there is a lot of amazingly positive things that uh, humans and the military industrial complex do. So in this case, we have the Ice Cube Observatory. This is in Antarctica. Okay, so very, very difficult to get there. My guess is most of the scientists haven't even been down there. You know, they're just looking at the data from on, on screens, essentially. So this is what you have, right? If you imagine there's this, the ice cube laboratory on top. So this is on top. You see that that building, right? That funny shaped building looks like a, like a grain silo or something. That's there. And now you have all of these 86 holes dug way far down into the ice. And then down into the ice, they put 5,000 DOMs. These are digital optical modules, okay? And these things can detect, can actually detect neutrinos. You know, how do they do that? It's something called Chernikov radiation. So Chernikov radiation is a form of energy that we perceive as a blue glow emitted when the electrically charged particles that compose atoms, so electrons and protons, neutrinos are actually neutral. But when these charged particles are moving at speeds faster than light, the speed of light in a specific medium okay so so what does that mean you, i thought nothing could travel faster than the speed of light well things can actually go faster than the speed of light but it depends what that light is going through right light doesn't go very fast through a, a brick wall essentially and through ice it does actually go slower than it does through the vacuum of the vacuum of space right neutrinos are interacting with atoms of the ice okay so they basically are Neutrinos, trillions of neutrinos are apparently going through us all the time, right? Except <laughs> they have very, very little mass and they have no charge. So you can't feel them. They don't really hit anything. There's, you know, basically like electrons. So in this case, the neutrinos come through and they hit an atom in the ice. Okay, this says glass, but that would be ice. That atom then will produce a high energy electron. So the energy from that neutrino hits that atom and knocks off an, a high energy electron. So this electron now is traveling faster than the speed of light now through the ice. Since it's traveling through ice faster than the speed of light, what happens is you get a similar effect as the speed of sound. This is a Mach wave, right? So what happens, same thing happens with sound is sound can only travel a certain speed in each medium, right? There's the speed of sound. What happens is if you're going faster than the speed of sound now, you're actually catching up with your sound as you're running. You're like, ah, and it's just building up, right? It's like a super yell. So if you imagine you're going the speed of sound and you yell, ah, that's just gonna keep building up into the shock wave, right? And it's gonna create a shock wave. And that is what you hear as the sound barrier breaking, right? Is actually these waves here, 
these waves passing over you. And that, that sounds like a giant boom, right? Why? Because all the sound is built up into the same wave front. It's all on the same wave front in time, essentially. That creates the mock cone and all these effects. So Cherenkov radiation works up the same basic principle. So now what you have is a neutrino comes in, hits the ice around these detectors. It's going to put off a high energy electron or some other particle. And now they will be able to tell where that neutrino is actually coming from and how much energy it showed up with, et cetera. So now you can detect neutrinos and their angle of incidence, how they're, how they're coming in, their speeds, everything, right? So now you have a detector. You definitely have a detector, a neutrino detector, okay? So first, I just want to go with those claims on what Hecker was saying is, how could this work as a air traffic control system for all of these vehicles? Okay, let's think about that. Well, first, we got to learn a little bit about neutrinos, okay? To be honest, I didn't really know what a neutrino was either, okay? But it turns out neutrinos are the most abundant particles that have mass in the universe, okay? That's good to know. Every time atomic nuclei come together, like in the sun, or break apart, like in a nuclear reactor, okay? they produce neutrinos. So look at that. Anytime a proton turns to a neutron or if anything's split apart or come together, now neutrinos are gonna be expelled, okay? Neutrinos are gonna be expelled. So we'll come back to that, okay? Remember that, nuclear reaction. Now let's look here. This is from Nature, published 15 March, 2012. Neutrinos transmit message through solid rock. Hmm, I wonder if this will be important for any military applications. Let's think about it. I'm going to put on my military hat here. Okay, Nature 2012. Nature is a top level uh, science magazine. All right, here we go. Beamline used to code the word neutrino as pulses of particles. So what I want to highlight here is, and I don't remember reading this in the news, is we were able to transmit, okay, transmit a message. We actually transmitted the word neutrino as pulses of particles of neutrinos through the earth, through solid rock. Okay, let, let me say that again. This is in 2012. So over 11 years ago, there is a valid scientific experiment of sending neutrinos through rock and communicating. And communicating. Think about that. Name one other form of communication that can go through solid rock. Name one. I mean, you have over-the-horizon radar. I mean, maybe we could tap. You could tap messages, you know, vibrational messages through water, ELF programs go very long distances through water. Do you kind of see where I'm going with this? All right, let's check it out. First, there was the telegraph, then there was the wireless radio, fiber optics, and now neutrinos? <laughs> yes, the science of physics have successfully transmitted a message from a particle acceler accelerator to an underground detector using the ghostly particles, okay? So that was 11 years ago, valid transmitting uh, a message using neutrinos. So we talked about it. Neutrinos are electrically neutral, almost massless particles produced in nuclear reactions. So, hmm, where do we have nuclear reactions that could be a big player? Maybe all of our ships. What about all those nuclear submarines, the $400 billion of nuclear submarines that the US and Australia are trying to put out into our world? Again, more nuclear submarines. So what would this mean? What would this mean for our nuclear submarine fleet? Well, first thing is you would be able to detect them. We'd be able to detect unless they have an amazing amount of neutrino shielding, which looks like it's difficult because neutrinos seem to go through everything. Then you would I, theoretically be able to determine if you can tell where something's coming from across the galaxy, you can probably tell where a nuclear submarine is located underneath the ocean. You could probably see where any nuclear reactor is, unless it has an amazing amount of neutron shielding, uh, neutron, neutrino shielding. Now we got to worry about neutrinos. And my guess is when they were building those nuclear reactors, they weren't concerned with neutrino shielding. Although my guess is on the newer <laughs> weaponized nuclear reactors, they will be, okay? And, and for this reason, I don't understand how it could be faster than light communication. I mean, it could definitely be faster than light through solid earth. Right, so in this case, if they could actually transmit, if they could transmit, and what he's saying is correct. Hecker's claim is that each one of these can actually transmit. It's not just a receiver. It's not just receiving 
high energy particles, supposedly it can actually create particles or in some way can, can aim this detector. I'm not sure how that works. At the very base level, okay, this could be used as one point in a detector to determine where any of uh, any nuclear reactors on the planet would be, right? Anything that's giving off neutrinos. So we'd be able to see the suns in other places. But if you can determine the angle, angle that a neutrino is coming in from all the way across the galaxy, I'm pretty sure if we had maybe one other detector in, say, the UK and one detector in the US, if you had three detectors on the Earth, you would be able to triangulate. My guess, again, this total speculation. Obviously, this is speculation. But if you had three of these um, neutrino detectors on the Earth, then you could you could triangulate probably anywhere on the Earth where a nuclear reactor is. That would be very, very useful. Okay. The second point is, could you communicate? And it looks like you can at least go from where the neutrinos are created to the detector. So if you had a small nuclear device, or if you were on a submarine or some other ship and you had a nuclear reactor, you had some way to control those neutrinos, then you could send communication, right? I mean, SOS started initially just as beep, 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 beep. And now what do we have? This is what we have now. So can you imagine if there's a new form of transferring information that goes through pretty much all types of matter, such as these neutrinos, I think it'd be very, very powerful. And of course you would keep it, you would keep it secret. So where did he give me that idea? He talks about the ELF. So watch this. There's an ELF system at the South Pole Station that when I was arrived, I was told it was off, dismantled, and completely defunct. In my work, I will rapidly just tell you, I had to figure out the circuitry for certain other repairs, and I found that this system is in fact completely energized, up and running, and being utilized with the other systems for nefarious purposes as well. Okay, so that's probably the, the most damning statement that I heard, right, is that there is an ELF, an actual ELF, working there. What is an ELF? An ELF is what they use to communicate with submarines. Okay, look guys, it's very difficult to communicate with submarines, obviously. First off, they're super stealth. They go under the water for who knows how many months and they don't want to be found. Okay, so they're very hard to find, very hard to communicate. And then, like I said, on deep under the ocean and you want secure communications, right? Electromagnetic waves in the extremely low frequency and super low frequency ranges can penetrate seawater to depths of hundreds of meters, allowing signals to be sent to submarines at their operating depths. Although it is a formidable challenge, as they have to work at incredibly long wavelengths, the US Navy's Project ELF system, which is a variant of a larger system proposed under codename Project Sanguine, operated at 76 hertz. So this is an ELF facility here. Remember, your wavelengths are so big, right? Your wavelengths are so big that it, it makes it difficult. You have to have a large transmitter, you have to use special um, electronic compression effects, et cetera, just to make it so that you can <laughs> communicate, right? To communicate. So what's interesting to me is Hecker is claiming that the ELF system at the South Pole, which was supposed to be dismantled and not in use, should not have worked at all. He was the electrician and the fire safety guy there. And he said the system was fully energized, fully, Energize. You had an ELF system, you know, I mean, you have a full facility here. If there's a full ELF facility operating down in Antarctica, that means that what are they using it for? Probably to communicate with the submarine fleet, right? And then if you are testing this other neutrino technology, that would be a great place to now test because you can communicate them with them on ELF. You can test that and now you can cross check it with your neutrino communication. The other thing Hecker mentions is that the power is just amazing, unbelievable. He said the amount of power that he assumed or saw actually there needed another power source. So where could you get another power source, right? How could you have another power source here? <laughs> and you guys are going to laugh, man. But again, what was I thinking is you just hook in a submarine, right? All you really need is another entrance to power this system, right? What's below this? You know, I personally, if it was me, I would have a submarine base down here. You just hook, bring your sub in and then crank that sucker in and you have mobile power nuclear reactors. We didn't build anything there. 
we just happen to have a way to plug in our nuclear reactors that are mobile in our ships that we bring around. And by the way, no one will see it. It'll be under the ice of Antarctica. It's just a perfect, perfect place. So, yeah. So assuming that's the case, that would be your military argument for why you would have a submarine detection system, right? Why you would use this ice cube neutrino observatory for, I mean, I guess not. Hecker is arguing is that you can also use it, right? If it's detecting neutrinos from any nuclear type of event, he says these craft are also putting out neutrinos. So this could be a detector for long range space things that we're supposedly looking at. Also our own nuclear fleet, we could be managing where everyone else's nuclear subs are, right? Every nuclear reactor, you could pretty much triangulate, I believe, using this system on the earth. Then you can also use it for, you guessed it, UAPs, right? If you have a UAP event, you know where all the submarines are. Uh-oh, this thing popped out of nowhere. There's a shows up out of nowhere nuclear device giving out neutrinos. All of a sudden, now I can identify that as a possible UAP craft, right? And now you can actually use your other techniques that David Grush mentioned, is to send your troops there, send your forces there, shoot anything down if you're in the proper area and then bring the retrieval back so that we can maintain our dominance and build more weapons down in the South Pole. Crazy time. I initially saw that briefing from Hecker and I was just blew my mind. I didn't see how it could even be possible. But now looking at it, it definitely is possible. I don't know if you, I don't know how you would transmit, right? How do you create a transmitter like this that he's talking about these DOMs, you know, 17 me meters apart, you know, what are they actually going to transmit? Are they transmitting neutrinos? In order to transmit neutrinos, you need a, you know, a fusion reaction. So I don't, I don't see how that could even be possible. It'd have to be a little tiny fusion reactor. And yeah, that would be amazing. But as far as actually detecting neutrinos and using them as a secret sub nuclear submarine slash enemy forces, nuclear reactor, you know, identification and location device. Yeah, I could definitely do it, at least theoretically, right? <laughs> and if I can figure this out from a basement of my house, then uh, I'm guessing other people can as well. So I thought that was interesting and exciting, those, those breakthroughs. Really, the more we learn about our universe, the more we learn about our ecosystem, about ourselves, about humans, about the nations, about Earth, how everything actually works, then we can remove the terrible pain to get there, okay? We're all in this spaceship together. And I really believe that we can actually work together, right? You see here, Marco Rubio says he's heard shocking firsthand accounts of UFOs. So it's not stopping. Grush, he's had no hits against him. And it's been almost, what, three weeks now? His credibility is just holding totally firm. And he's going, sounds like Kirsten Gillibrand is going to have open hearings with Grush. Marco Rubio said that they've had many other people, okay? Rubio told News Nation that there are others in the intelligence community who have come forward with firsthand accounts of UFO hardware, okay? So that's Rubio saying that. It sounds like they're going to come out, man. The stuff is going to blow, and I think it should. The stuff, the military-industrial complex, just out of control, everybody. We really need to bring it back. I think we can do it for peace. We actually can live on Earth in peace. It is possible. I know it doesn't seem possible because you want to go out and shoot everybody, but it actually can be done. So thanks for being here, everyone. Please like and subscribe this video and support the channel. Get exclusive backstage content at patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. Have a great day. Peace.